the cross. I won't waste too much time on the niceties, the formalities. We're a little behind starting. I do want to say a few words about the general theme of our symposium. Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Year of Faith, and the New Evangelization. We deliberately chose October, especially October 12th, because we want to have a date in the month of Our Lady, especially when we want to pray the rosary, as the old hymn went, the prayer with power divine, because Our Lady is omnipotence and prayer, and that is so true, because it's very close to the concluding stupendous apparition in Fatima, when Our Lady showed that indeed she is omnipotence and prayer, all she has to do is move her finger twice and the sun will jump, out of course or into course. We smile at that, but the fact is, that's what actually happened. There were over 50,000 people, witnesses, that there's something quite extraordinary took place. And finally, the close of the year of faith, which as many of you may already know, is going to take place precisely on the 13th of October in Rome, with a total consecration of the entire world to the Immaculate Heart, with one of the original statues of Our Lady of Fatima present and present for the occasion. So our present Holy Father is making it very clear to us that the three items that we chose to relate to one another are not simply being thrown together. It's all coincidental. It does make a difference as the conclusion of the encyclical on the light of faith makes clear, Pope Benedict as well as Pope Francis. If we want to have a faith that's more than simply an acceptance of this or that abstract proposition, if we're going not only to believe but to believe in, that is to say, as it were, to as were, allow our Lord to be the one who lives in us, through whose eyes and uh, through the eyes uh, we have a complete vision, a sure basis, for conducting our life, for helping others to do so, and to arrive at heaven. Our Lady is our mother as well as the mother of God. She is the mediatrix of all graces, and especially in these particular circumstances in which we find ourselves and the Church finds itself, well, she is the mother of holy faith. Without her intervention, without her maternal care of us, our faith will be dead. Whereas well, the whole objective of this year of faith, as it were, is to enliven our faith, so that our faith, as it were, reflects an extension of her faith. Because her faith, her fiat, her, let be it done to me according to thy word. Her complete and total 100% believing that brought Jesus, our Savior, ever to us. And it is she who helps us to meet him, to recognize him as our Savior, and be willing, as it were, to do anything he asks us to do, even to lose our lives to help bring others to the, uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the faith. We have no fear uh, that has verified so many times as they were in the concentration camps of the mother great saints who helped others to keep their faith and not lose their hope and dis, uh, despair in the midst of circumstances far more difficult than any that most of us have so far experienced. So first point, first topic, topic is the Marian mediation of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Know you not, she said to St. Juan Diego, know you not that I am your mother? What does it mean to say Our Lady is our mother? What does it mean to take her into, into our hearts, into our homes? That's our Lord's instruction, not mine. Not some other saint. It is Jesus' will that we take her into our homes so that we might believe and hope and above all, love as she does. So that's the first talk. Second talk will be on what is our response than to Our Lady, so that we might believe as she believed, to believe in Jesus, Jesus, and to identify with him completely, above all, at the foot of the cross, in the mystery of the Eucharist, Eucharist, consecration. That is what is the like, total consecration to our Immaculate Heart, and then we will begin to live our faith, 
and act on our faith as she did and continues to do in us. And then finally, because in believing in Jesus, we believe in the charity that he's got, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. What is the great command? To love God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves, as Jesus did on, on the cross. And so we have, as it were, if there were a, simple, a simple logical extension. If we believe, as Our Lady does, then we will want to proclaim the good news. And we have a wonderful example in St. Maximilian Kolbe, uh, the martyr of charity, who as a priest gave his life that another might live. Exactly what our Lord did on the cross, but not just for one, for all, all, all of us. So that explains the logic of our, 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 our program. Three points, but they are key, po uh, key points, and they are the ones which our present Holy Father is underlining continuously in order to activate a new, not a different proclamation, but a more lively, a more felt pro proclamation. So that is enough by way of introduction to the general, th uh, general theme. Our first speaker is Dr. Gloria Dodd, who is a professor on the faculty of the Marian Institute in Dayton, Ohio. In case you ever need a book on Our Lady, that's the place to go. It is the largest collection of books on Our Lady any place in the world. We must be grateful for that. Uh, you will find there things that you won't find any place else, or maybe a few places, but you will spend a great deal on, on airfares, if, <laughs> <laughs> and you may not, may not find what you are looking for because you'll get to another library and they tell you, oh yes, there's uh, on a list, but somebody borrowed it and didn't bring it back. It happens all the time. You understand why they chain books in the Middle Ages. Anyway, I won't waste too much time. You see a little outline of her career. She's a, you know, she's a lady of many, many parts, a wife, a mother, a mother, a teacher in high, high school, and now a professor at, uh, at the university level. And she'll talk to us about, uh, about uh, uh, can I say, a spin-off from her doctoral dissertation. You'll find copies of it on the table there. You might, might ask her to sign one of another cop uh, copies. They deal with Cardinal Mercier and based again his contribution to the history of Marian theology in our, our times. Important, why? Because he also happens to be one of the major, major Catholic art of, uh, uh, um, uh, creators of the ecumenical movement. People say, if you're ecumenical, you can't be Marian. If you're Marian, you can't be ecumenical. But the fact of the matter is, if you are fully Marian, you will be fully ecumenical in the, uh, there is no opposition there. But her theme will be, and is an important one, Marian mediation, maternal mediation, at Guadalupe, at Fatima, and finally Vatican II, because we know, as it were, one of the purposes of this uh, year of faith, as it was conceived by Pope Benedict XVI, was precisely to bring us to recognize uh, that the whole purpose of Vatican II was not to change doctrine, but to us enliven our faith so that we might live it and proclaim it and help others, as it were, to believe and hope, hope, and above all, love, uh, love Jesus. So now I give the microphone to, to Gloria. Thank you, Father, for your kind introduction and, for your, and to everyone for your gracious welcome, which is a good way to start with the year of faith. As Bishop Fulton Sheen once said about applause, at the start of a lecture, it is a manifestation of faith. In the middle, it is a sign of hope. At the end, it is always charity. <laughs> And in keeping with the theme of the Year of Faith, please join me in praying a traditional act of faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh my God, I believe that you are one God in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches in those who become them. You can neither deceive nor be deceived. 
Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In this year of faith, why does this talk focus on Lumen Gentium? In his apostolic letter, Porta Fidei, or the Door of Faith, Benedict XVI made October 12th, 2012, to November 24th, 2013, the Year of Faith, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council and the 30th anniversary of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Benedict XVI asked Catholics to know Christ better by studying the official documents of the Second Vatican Council and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Why? Held from 1963 to 1965, Vatican II is the most recent ecumenical council of the Pope and the bishops of the world. At a Vatican Council, as Lumen Gentium 25 explains, the Holy Spirit infallibly protects the teaching, the official teaching from error, and so of the 16 official documents that the Vatican II published, only four were named constitutions. And of these four, two, Dei Verbum and Lumen Gentium, were dogmatic constitutions that is, focused especially on the dogmas of the Church. Published in November of 1964, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the Church, had an entire chapter focused on Mary. And in that chapter, section 62, validated the Church's use of the title Mediatrix. A year later, Dei Verbum, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, provided a context that is needed for today's topic. In particular, Dei Verbum made an important distinction between public and private revelation. As Dei Verbum explained, God's communication to man has shown forth in deeds and in words over the centuries, culminating in Christ, the fullness of the truth. Christ's one deposit of truth is then passed down from the apostles to us today by sacred tradition, some of which is written down as sacred scripture. When the truths taught by the church are divine, as divinely revealed, they are called dogmas. They do not change. As the Holy Spirit guides the, holy, the believer's reflection on these divinely revealed truths, there is a growth in the understanding of the realities and the words which have been handed down. Thus, the church's doctrines that is, its official teachings on matters of faith and morals, develop organically, as blessed John Henry Newman explained. They grow to expand to include logical deductions from the premises, but they never contradict the past. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 65 to 67, explains this development as brings out the, both the explicit and the implicit truths of revelation. It remains for the Catholic faith gradually to grasp its full significance over the course of the centuries. With some of the recent media shock over papal statements, it is important to remember that dogmas and doctrines are both different from disciplines, that is, the Church's instructions on how to follow or live out the doctrines. Disciplines, such as priestly celibacy, can and have changed according to cultures and times. But this media confusion reinforces the importance of knowing the difference between Church's dogmas and doctrines that develop but do not contradict the past and disciplines that indeed can change in times and places. 
Although De Verbum does not address divine revelations, that is, visions or locutions made to mystics, the Catechism clarifies this point. Private revelations do not belong, however, to the deposit of the faith. It is not their role to improve or complete Christ's revelation, but to help live more fully by it in a certain period of history. Thus, approved apparitions show us how to apply the Church's teaching. Therefore, today this paper aims to show that Mary's universal mediation of grace has been taught by Lumen Gentium in continuity with the past Marian apparitions and in continuity with St. Maximilian Kolbe's teaching. And her universal mediation remains the model for the new evangelization today. First, let us First, let us go ahead and define our terms. Mary's universal mediation actually um, is rooted, first of all, in the term mediation. Thomas Aquinas defined a mediator as a mean or a middle person who is simultaneously different from and similar to the two extremes and that unites these two extremes. Mediatrix is simply the feminine form of mediator. In the hypostatic union, Christ is the one and only mediator who is a perfect and permanent union of God and man, having one divine person and two natures, human and divine, and whose death on the cross reunited forgiven humanity with God. However, others participate in mediation in a subordinate and dependent way on Christ's primary and independent mediation, such as prophets who prepare people to be united with God and ministers who sacramentally unite people with God. Thus, Mary participates in Christ's mediation in a subordinate, dependent, and yet true mediation between God and man, first for her role in the incarnation, and then for her role in uniting Christ with man. For this discussion, the glossary of the Catechism of the Catholic Church provides a theological meaning for grace in general, as the free and undeserved gift from God that gives us the ability to respond to our vocation to become his adopted children. The Catechism then specifies different types of grace. Sanctifying grace, a share in God's divine life and friendship with us in a habitual gift, a stable and supernatural disposition that enables the soul to live with God, to act by his love. Actual grace is God's help to conform our lives to his will. Sacramental grace and special graces are gifts of the Holy Spirit to help us live out our Christian vocation. So today's discussion will refer more to grace in the sense of freely given participation in God's life, spiritual life. The other meanings of grace are not excluded because this paper aims to show that Mary mediates all graces. So how can Mary mediate all graces or get? She was united with Christ, subordinately and dependently, but still truly in the redemption of all people. Her union with Christ was preceded by her union with the Holy Spirit, who had dwelt in her since her immaculate conception. The Holy Spirit formed Christ's body in her womb, and God's ways do not change. The Holy Spirit continues to form the mystical body of Christ in her spiritual womb. Thus, every grace we receive from Christ with the Holy Spirit comes to us through Mary. At this lovely shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, it is only fitting 
that we start with Our Lady of Guadalupe's mediation. It is also chronologically the first of the events in today's study. And as the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. We will look first at Mary's deeds. When she appeared December 9th through 12th, 1531, to Saint Juan Diego. How did Mary act as universal mediatrix at this apparition? Five ways stand out. First, she was outreaching. She literally reached out to Juan Diego, calling him by name when he came to Tepeyac Hill. He had not asked for her to appear. She came on her own initiative, or more precisely, prompted by the Holy Spirit, she came. And in the last apparition, when Juan Diego was trying to avoid her, she even came down the hill and blocked his passage. We have her mediation as questioning. Her style was dialogic. In her first and her last apparition, she asked Juan Diego, where are you going? Inviting a response. Other times, she asked rhetorical questions just to reassure Juan Diego. Am I not here, I who am your mother? She was pregnant. Mary's rather substantial waist and her black belt tied so high indicated in an Aztec culture that she was pregnant at the time of the apparition. But Jesus Christ has already been born. Who was in her womb? The mystical body of Christ is still being formed spiritually in her womb. Subordinate to the church's authority, she respected the authority of the bishop for the well-being of his diocese. She did not have a church built without his permission. Miraculous image. Mary left a sacramental that then, again in a sort of a prophetically dispositive mediation, disposed nine million native people to convert in 12 years after the apparition. She chose to mediate through an image that prompted people to recognize she was one of them. So we see how Mary's deeds show a spirit of love, of obedience, and solidarity in her actions as Guadalupe. Mary's words at Guadalupe further refine an understanding of her mediation. There are many things that she said that could fit into the various categories, but for the sake of brevity, I will provide only one example for each category. Universal mediation. Her comforting words are such a treasure. I am truly your merciful mother, yours and all the people who live united in this land and of all the other people of different ancestries. Her motherhood is not limited to Juan Diego, the Aztecs, and the Spanish, but includes all people of all races and all times. This universal motherhood is the foundation for her mediation. Magnifying the Lord, Mary's mediation has the glory of God as her ultimate purpose. Why does she ask for a church to be built? As she said, a little house built here for me in which I will show him, I will exalt him and make him manifest. Inclusive and delegating. When Juan Diego begged Our Lady, please send someone else to be the messenger because he had failed in his first attempt to convince the bishop, Our Lady replied, I do not lack servants and messengers to whom I can give the task of carrying out my words, who will carry out my will. 
but it is very necessary that you plead my cause and with your help and through your mediation that my will be fulfilled. Thus, Mary's mediation deliberately included Juan Diego and the bishop, since she could have appeared directly to the bishop if she had wanted to. But instead, she chose to go through Juan Diego, just as God has been delegating to her and allowing her the joy of cooperating with him in his work. Mary delegates to her children to share in her joy in doing God's work. Bringing Christ to man. Again, she says, I will give him to the people in all my personal love, my compassion, in my help, in my protection. Universal healer, here I will heal all their sorrows, their hardships, and sufferings. In this sense, universality refers to her ability to intercede for the healing of any cross. Thus, Mary's speech at Guadalupe, as Guadalupe, illustrates how Mary's humble motherhood glorifies God and includes others in this task of uniting all people to Christ. She is a wonderful example of mediatrix to the mediator, and along with being an evangelization of the native peoples, she already had begun a form of the new evangelization because she was teaching also the Spanish conquistadors, calling them back to a practice of their Christian faith in understanding the human dignity of the native peoples, their brothers and sisters, with Mary as their mother. The next example of mediation in this survey is Our Lady's appearances to the three children of Fatima, Lucia dos Santos, Francisco, and Jacinta Marto. In this series of apparitions that started on May 13th and officially ended on October 13th, 1917, Our Lady's message was already given in a post-enlightenment context with many lapsed Catholics who had become agnostics and even atheists in Portugal, particularly in the face of World War I's terrible toll of death. Thus, Mary's message directed to Catholics in general was already a new evangelization, calling lax Catholics to a fervent practice of their faith. And at Fatima, Our Lady's mediation already has some of the same characteristics as the previous apparition. Indeed, she reaches out, initiating contact, she again is inclusive and delegating. She had the three children take her message to the Pope and to the bishops, as well as to the, all of the church asking us to pray the rosary daily. And also, it was a deliberate mediation. She had clearly planned this out. At the first apparition, she asked them to come for six more months. And in July, she also promised a miracle in October. She was doing her advance planning with promotion starting three months in advance. She had public signs. At the separate second apparition, other people besides the three children were experiencing supernatural phenomena. Even in August, when the children had been kidnapped and were not even present, some saw a cloud come down on the home oak. Others felt a change in temperature or heard sounds like the buzzing of a bee. Of course, the grand finale was the miracle of the sun on October 13th, with the spinning, the colors, the immediate drying of the ground experienced by all present, thousands of devout believers 
as well as atheists and agnostics. And a centrality of Christ in the midst of that miracle of the sun, one of the scenes that the three children saw was Christ in the center of the sun with the Holy Family, Joseph and Mary, on either side. Mary's words also at Fatima show that she, her mediation was actually explicitly instructive as well asking everyone to pray the daily rosary with 50 Hail Marys. She taught us the value and power of her intercessory role, even stating, quote, Our Lady of the Rosary alone can be of any help. But privately requesting that Russia be consecrated to her Immaculate Heart, Mary again taught how God chose to work through her in bringing the gift of conversion. Her mediation is a type of prophetic mediation in her words. And empowering, in a statement probably dear to many a teacher, Mary told Lucia she must learn to read. And her command is again preparing people to receive the grace and to cooperate with the graces from God. Her mediation brings man to Christ. The prayer she taught, O oh Jesus, this is for love of thee, for the conversion of sinners and reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And subordinate to church authority, request was made to the Pope and the bishops for them to consecrate the world to her Immaculate Heart. And I can't help but notice her promotional abilities. Promising a miracle three months in advance is certainly a way to draw a crowd. And so we see that her public miracle concluded on October 13, 1917, just four days before St. Maximilian Kolbe founded his Mar Marian Apostolate. At this shrine, kind, tended so kindly by the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, we must be sure to include St. Maximilian Kolbe. And as a well-integrated person, Kolbe's actions complemented his words. He asked of others only what he himself did first. And what did he do about Mary's mediation? Well, first he consecrated himself, having experienced his own Marian apparition that prompted him as a boy to choose the two crowns of purity and martyrdom. It's no surprise that as a 16-year-old seminarian, he consecrated himself to Mary. And this entrustment was renewed in 1917 when he started the Militia Immaculata. Indeed, this group was Colby's deliberate participation in Mary's mission of crushing the head of the serpent. On October 17, 1917, he founded this with six other seminarians in Rome. He chose to succeed in the spiritual battle by working under the direction, a subordinate mediation to the Immaculate Virgin Mary. And Miraculous Medal was made great use of by St. Maximilian Kolbe, the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, as it is formally named. He wore it, he prayed its invocation, and he made these two things requirements for membership in the Militia Immaculata. With these lived experiences of the power of Mary's mediation, Colby taught often and explicitly about Mary's universal mediation in many talks and writings. Here are just a few highlights. United with the Holy Spirit. The basis for Mary's mediation from Colby's perspective is the most intimate and close relationship possible for a human being to have with the Holy Spirit. 
She was completely filled with the Holy Spirit and so united to him that he works through her. The difficulty is how to express this relationship. A typically Franciscan approach would be to call Mary the spouse of the Holy Spirit, as Colby did. But Colby's original contributions were to propose new descriptions of Mary as the created Immaculate Conception, the personification of the Holy Spirit, who is the uncreated Immaculate Conception, that is, the fruit of the love between the Father and the Son. Colby's most controversial description of Mary was as a quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Although there is really no need for confusion because Colby clearly distinguished quasi or almost an incarnation, meaning not an incarnation, and that she is a separate human person from the divine person. He's distinguishing from Christ's incarnation, where in the hypostatic union, there was only one divine person with two natures, human and divine. Colby himself wrote, it is an unexplainable but perfect union by reason of which the Holy Spirit does not act except through the Immaculata, his spouse. She therefore is the mediatrix of all the graces of the Most Holy Spirit. And Colby clearly understood that as the mediatrix of all graces, Mary empowers the apostolate. In a recruiting leaflet for the MI, Colby describes Mary's mediation as the prompt, the shield, and the source of success for the apostolic worker. And therefore, he required this consecration to give ourselves to the Immaculate Virgin as instruments in her Immaculate hands. Colby clearly saw Mary's mediation as a path to Christ, neither detracting nor diverting from Christ's one mediation. Quote, we know perfectly well that the object of all devotion is God. In the same way, the cult offered to the Immaculata is a direct means to this end. We should search for Jesus through her and not in another place, but in her. We pass with her to the other. Thus St. Maximilian Kolbe lived and taught the mystery of Mary's immaculate mediation. While with his death in 1941, Kolbe did not live to see the Second Vatican Council's teaching on Mary's mediation, but I think he would be happy with much of it. As Lumen Gentium had been contextualized with much dispute, many theologians had emphasized Mary's relationship with Christ and therefore, in a Christotypical approach, affirmed that Mary was the mediatrix of all graces. Other theologians opposed this title, emphasizing Mary's relationship with the church. Or others thought, well, how can we explain this mysterious mediation? Others worried that perhaps it would be contrary to the pastoral and ecumenical purposes of the council. So these ecclesial typical theologians persuaded the council fathers to include the Marian doctrines in the Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, and specifically in chapter 8. They also succeeded in eliminating the specification of all graces in the compromise statement of number 62. The Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix. The press and even some theologians misconstrued this to mean it was a rejection of the church's past teaching and a downgrading of Mary. But was this an accurate assessment? Perhaps not. 
a comparison of what Lumen Gentium stated with the earlier definition of Mary's universal mediation will provide a better answer. As the council intended, Lumen Gentium took a pastoral and ecumenical approach that started with a gentle indication that Mary is a mediatrix. But if we think about it, if Mary invokes, excuse me, if the church invokes Mary as a mediatrix, the church does so because Mary is a mediatrix. So Lumen Gentium also goes on to clearly present Mary as uniting God and man in Christ. She is named the mother of God. And also, she brings Christ to man and man to Christ. Section 60 states, Mary's salutary influence on men does not hinder in any way the immediate union of the faithful with Christ, but on the contrary, fosters it. As far as being subordinate to and dependent on Christ, the one mediator, Lumen Gentium clearly states, quote, Mary's function as mother of men in no way obscures or diminishes this unique mediation on Christ, but rather shows its power. It flows forth from the superabundance of the merits of Christ, rests on his mediation, depends entirely on it, and draws all its power from it. Thus, Lumen Gentium validated the church's application of mediatrix to Mary because she certainly fulfilled the general definition and role of a mediatrix between God and man, as well as between Christ and man. But did Lumen Gentium concede to her a mediation of grace? Well, let's see. Lumen Gentium did agree on the interpretation of grace as spiritual life in section 61, stating, quote, in a wholly singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, and burning charity in the work of the Savior in restoring supernatural life in souls. And for this reason, she is a mother to us in the order of grace. This statement provided a solid premise that combined with the second step that motherhood is indeed a type of mediation, yields the conclusion that Mary is a mediatrix of grace. In regard to the universality of Mary's mediation, Lumen Gentium expresses this in other words. The ecclesiotypical approach noted that Mary is a type of the church in perfect union with Christ. Carlo Balisch, one of the primary co-authors of Lumen Gentium, explained that the footnotes help to interpret the document. So applying that, we see that footnote 16 cited Pius XII's radio message to Fatima on May 13, 1946, in which the Pope explained that Mary's permanent association with Christ in the distribution of the graces which flow from the mediation. And thinking logically about this statement, which graces come from Christ's redemption? All graces. Footnote 16 also helped to answer this question by citing Agitricium Populi, an encyclical by Leo XIII, that described Mary as the dispenser of all heavenly gifts. So we see also that Lumen Gentium progresses to explain Mary's mediation in terms of her union with the Holy Spirit. Although this may be one of the weaker parts of the document, Lumen Gentium said it very simply, Mary is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
but also explains that she is the mother of the members of Christ, which is a stronger statement of her mediation. So Lumen Gentium taught explicitly that Mary can be called a mediatrix and a mother of grace, and implies that this is to be understood in the sense of a universal mediation. This is a true development that went beyond anything that had been said officially about Mary's mediation in a council document. And although it did not directly affirm the title of Mary as mediatrix of all graces, Lumen Gentium remained open to it and to further organic development, as chapter 54 expressed it. Lumen Gentium was not intended to be a complete document, doctrine on Mary, nor to decide those questions which the work of theologians has not yet fully clarified. Those opinions, therefore, may be lawfully retained which are propounded in Catholic schools concerning her who occupies a place in the church which is highest after Christ and also closest to us. So having completed this historical review and theological analysis of the apparitions and doctrines culminating with Second Vatican Council, it is time to briefly propose some applications of this beautiful doctrine to the new evangelization. As John Paul II put it, we are to learn from Mary in the school of Mary. And so synthesizing some general ideas from all that has been said above, three points remain as constants, either explicitly or implicitly. Consecration to Mary as her child, her messenger, and her soldier turns our weakness into strength today. Her maternal and loving aspects to act as Mary to see and serve Christ in others, being subordinate to church authority, obedient to the Pope, one's bishop, one's pastor, brings the necessary graces from God. Ask permission from the proper ecclesiastical authorities before attempting some apostolic work. And if they say no, when you are convinced that what you are asking is God's will, then ask them what proof they might need in order to say yes. And if they still say no, then just ask their successor or another bishop or pastor. Imitating Mary's mediation style, we see that we need to reach out, initiate conversations, even chase after someone who might be trying to avoid you. Welcome that visitor at church. Chat after mass. Invite one's new neighbor or one's lapsed Catholic family member to come with you to church. Of course, it helps if there is coffee and donuts afterwards. <laughs> Ask questions. Dialogue. Mary asked Juan Diego, where are you going? That's a very profound question to ask anyone about their life and their afterlife. And another gentle question could be to a lapsed Catholic, have you ever considered coming back to the Catholic Church? Learning someone's objections is the first step in overcoming them. Plan events, advertise, and at least three months in advance. Marketing and media can be used to promote the Catholic faith as EWTN, Radio Maria, and Air Maria have already shown us. Include and delegate. The new evangelization requires the organization of people to work together with Mary and with each other to accomplish more than they could alone. Learn from those who are more experienced 
And then the learned and the experienced can train others to take their place. Imitating Our Lady of Guadalupe in particular, I would say, use her image. She gave it quite precisely to be shown. A visually, visual and scientifically verified miracle that appeals to a modern world. We see how that, you know, the images in her eye surviving a bomb blast. The image is not painted, not a photograph. It seems to float on the surface of the tilma. These things can be used to reach out to the scientifically minded modern person. Pro-life work in a culture of death, indeed the Aztec culture in which a thousand victims had to be sacrificed, human victims, every year on every temple by law in the Aztec empire. Mary came to bring the gospel of life that overcomes this. Today, we live in a very similar culture of death. Over 2,000 children aborted daily in our country alone. Many lapsed Catholics are going into abortions. You see the rosaries hanging on their car when they drive in. Many former Catholics are active in the pro-life movement but left the Catholic Church, some saying, I never heard a priest or anyone in the church speak about the pro-life movement. How important it is that we do that to prevent people from leaving and to reach out to bring them back. Our Lady of Fatima also moder um, models for us how gathering people together in a rally and also having processions as they do at Fatima. A public spectacle brings people. Rosary for peace in today's terrorist culture and fears of another world war that very much touches the heart of both practicing and lapsed Catholics to pray together for world peace. A rally is a wonderful opportunity for a short instruction. And we see when we combine it with benediction, it is a wonderful way to focus on the centrality of Christ. Colby emphasized the importance of consecration. We ourselves have to be united to mediate under Mary's mediation. And the miraculous medal as a tangible sacramental, especially when worn around the neck, we see a powerful way to be open to the graces that God wishes to give us and through us. Let us be a living miraculous medal. And we see that Lumen Gentium itself, in a way, can be a little intimidating as an official document on the church, but try a study group. That means, first of all, we have to have a copy of Lumen Gentium, and it's easy enough today, you can just go on the Vatican website, download an electronic version. Although myself, I prefer a physical booklet because then I can highlight and make notes and keep it even after there are many electronic upgrades that would not have kept my previous version. <laughs> and it does help to have someone like a priest, a deacon, a religious, or maybe a religion teacher to lead a study group there are many helpful study guides available for free on the internet. So we see that there's also a style that Lumen Gentium mod models for us to proclaim Mary in the context of Christ and the church. Mary's mediation flows precisely from her maternal mediation, her maternal relationship with Christ and with us the body of Christ, the church. Everyone has a mother, and the analogy of an unborn child in his mother's womb is an easy way for many people to understand how Mary mediates everything for her unborn mystical body of Christ. And explain the principles 
If someone has trouble with the title, Mediatrix of All Graces, go back to the foundations. Explain the reasons for her mediation. And then hopefully, people can make that logical deduction to the truthful conclusion. And of course, avoid disputes. Even if someone still disagrees with Mary's universal mediation of grace, friendly discussions, not arguments, win hearts. So in conclusion, hopefully this paper has shown that Mary's universal mediation is indeed contained in both uh, apparitions, Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Fatima, and how Mary has uh, been so beautifully taught to us through St. Maximilian Kolbe and also Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium, being an official doctrine of the church, has helped the entire church to understand more clearly the basis for Mary's mediation with much explicitly in the text, but also implicitly in its footnotes, while remaining open to the Holy Spirit's next steps in the development of this doctrine. So reflecting on all these things, let us indeed invoke Our Lady as mediatrix of all graces, as the immaculate mediatrix, in order to set our hearts on fire with her immaculate heart to turn ever more to the sacred heart of Jesus. As we pray, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, our mediator with the Father, who has been pleased to appoint the most blessed Virgin, your mother, to be our mother also, and our mediatrix with you, mercifully grant that whoever comes to you seeking your favors may rejoice to receive all of them through her. Amen. Mary Immaculate, Mediatrix of all graces, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I think we have time for one or two questions before we take a break. Is that everyone? Okay. Yes. Can we come forward, please, for the, the microphone? Oh, here is it. Father Grinner of the Fatima Apostolate <laughs> continues to campaign for, world, uh, for the consecration of Russia um, to Mary. And so my question is, um, Russia just came up with a peace plan for Syria. I think that's due sign that Mary is acting. So I'm wondering, is the sea have um, battle fatigue, do you think? Does Father Grinner have battle fatigue? I don't know. Very, uh, um, I think indeed praying for everyone and, and for those who might be confused about whether the consecration has been made or not, I think it helps um, to realize that that question was actually asked of Sister Lucia while she was living. And she did answer it, that God did accept that. It was very interesting, Pope John Paul II actually did a consecration first, just sort of by himself, you know, and he invited people to participate. And he actually, I found this fascinating, he would check with Sister Lucia. And the first time he checked, Sister Lucia said, let me get back to you, <laughs> which sort of hinted about an ongoing conversation she was having. She did get back to him, and her answer was the first time, no, that did not do it. So the Pope tried a second time. You know what they say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So John Paul II did try a second time, explicitly asking the bishops of the world to join him in consecrating the world to the Immaculate Heart. And many responded. Again, he checked with Sister Lucia, and thankfully, the answer came back affirmatively the second time. 
So myself, I would say that if Sister Lucia were the messenger the first time for the request, I myself am very confident in her confirmation that it has been fulfilled. Although I do find it a beautiful sign that our Pope Francis tomorrow in Rome will be reaffirming that consecration, which I find a wonderful sign for this Pope and hopefully for our world. I think we have to take a pause, prepare for the second conference to be delivered by Monsignor Wangen. I want to thank Gloria for this wonderful presentation of a difficult subject. I think it was very clear that uh, we have always believed in the mediation of Our Lady. There is no other access to our Savior except through her. her. And there is no access to the Father except through the mediator. This is the way St. Francis of Assisi summarized. summarized. So once again, thanks. Thanks. And we'll be uh, perhaps uh, waiting for some of your comments. Subsequently. Yes, thank you.